Okay, Sarah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start recording in Zoom as well. Okay, sorry for the glitch at the beginning. Still got to figure out all of the buttons that have to be pushed to make this all work. It's a complicated way to write a book, but it's, it's productive. It gets people together, and uh, we enjoy these sessions each week uh, to uh, continue this conversation about uh, the history of the first wilderness. Um, this experiment uh, is unfolding in interesting ways that we can explain at some point, but let's move quickly to introducing Jim Schaefer. Um, with whom we've been working on this endeavor since last fall. Uh, he's given us a lot of content already. Um, and very importantly, he has given us permission to um, extract from uh, Vince Schaefer's memoir, Serendipity and Science, uh, two really compelling stories. And we'll be exploring those uh, in this conversation. Um, so Jim, thanks for joining us. Um, as I mentioned to you, our nine questions have evolved into nine shorter prompts that we'll ask you sequentially. Um, essentially, we'll just ask you to give us five minute stories um, on, on areas that are of most interest to us in writing this collaborative history. So Mae Bratton, uh, our, our uh, co-host uh, from uh, Skidmore, uh, sophomore there, uh, has joined us again. She's back. Um, May, why don't you take it from here and we'll just start our prompts. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for being here, James. Um, so our first prompt is um, about childhood. So um, more specifically, um, what, oh, sorry, in five minutes, please take up um, your first aha moment when you decided what you wanted to do with your life to what you had for breakfast this morning? <laughs> well, it was <clears throat> that's pretty simple. I had Cheerios with blueberries. And boy, was that ever good. And of course, a cup of coffee. Um, as far as an aha moment, there was no one aha moment in my life. I had a lot of ahas, thank goodness. Um, I suppose one of the very seminal points was in my uh, senior year in high school, I uh, had heard through the grapevine that there were a lot of forest fires in Arizona. And uh, having traveled all over the West as a younger person, along with my family, I was enamored with the fact that Flagstaff, Arizona, which I knew was on fire. And so I was able to get on a plane and go down to Flagstaff. And I walked on as a crew member to fight forest fires in the Coconino outside of Flagstaff. And while I was fighting fire, uh, I got the in inspiration that maybe I wanted to do something with my life around the forests and forest fire and preservation of, preservation of forests that were burning. And so uh, later on, I enrolled at the University of Montana and entered their forestry school to learn uh, forest management and specialize in forest fire research. And I spent most of the rest of the four years I was in forestry uh, working in fire weather. That is to say, looking at how fire might be modified by having thunderstorms rain on them, and also how lightning was starting forest fires. So it was all during those years that I was having that aha realization of, boy, it's a beautiful, a beautiful area to be in the woods. And uh, that was part of the fulfillment of my life was to be in the woods. So I think uh, that completes your response there, Jim. Anything else you want to add to that? Well, boy, there's a lot more, but uh, <laughs> we haven't reached five minutes yet. Bill has. Well, I understand. So, yet, but... so I was in forestry school, but I was also doing a lot of drinking on the side, drinking alcoholic beverages in bars. And there came a point when I had 
a D and two Fs in forestry that the dean called me in and said, Jim, what's going on? And why don't you go across campus and raise your grade point average, which I did. I went into anthropology and all of a sudden I fell in love with anthropology. And it took me another two years to graduate but uh, lacking seven credits of a Bachelor of Science in Forestry, I ended up with a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology. And because of the Vietnam War, got married and located myself near Canada because I was anti-Vietnam War and a draft dodger. So I went to graduate school and got married. My wife also went into graduate school with me at the time. And we both finished up our PhDs and I did in cultural anthropology and she studied uh, um, oncology, cancer research on ovarian cancer, which she died of about 20 years later. Um, but we both got our PhDs and, and went to Buffalo. Uh, went to, uh, we were at Buffalo and we went to Montana and at the, back at the University of Montana where I'd done my undergraduate work, I was a faculty member. But the way alcohol played a role is my major professor asked me what I knew a lot about. And in an unabashed moment of honesty, I said, I know a lot about drinking. And he said, well, that's what you should do your doctoral dissertation on, which I did. And I did a worldwide study of drinking and fighting in 60 different societies. And so I set myself on an academic career uh, teaching anthropology, but also specializing in alcohol studies. So that was a, a couple, two or three aha moments, May. Great. Well, thanks for that. Um, let's, let's turn to Vincent, your father. Um, I guess we could ask, what did your father think of your career choice? That'd be one question. Um, uh, but then what do you most remember Vince for? Uh, and what should we all remember him for? What, what achievements in his life most stand out to you? Well, it's pretty clear that both my mother and father were aghast at the fact that I was studying alcohol and, and at some point later on gambling, because that was something they never, ever would do. They would not go to bars, and they certainly would never go to a casino or be in a card game. So boy, was that ever a freedom moment for me, because being a, a young kid, in the home of a world famous research scientist was a difficult road to hoe. Uh, I had to make a name for myself. Everybody around me was saying, oh, Jimmy, you're going to grow up to be, fill the, the footsteps of your father. And I could never do that. And so I had, to, I had to find a way of making my own tracks. And it was because my father was, was one of those people that was just bigger than life it was a very important step for me to go away. But the thing I most remember about my father is that he was an incredibly curious person. He just was curious about everything. And uh, in the natural sciences, I should say, but in life as well. So the fact that he had from his very early days, a basic curiosity about how things work, how they, how they fit together, and is there a good explanation for any kind of a phenomenon? And he had uh, the knack of making keen observations. And I have a feeling that some of his observational skills came from when he was a kid and was hunting arrowheads in the fields right behind the house where I live, the house that he built along with my mother and my uncle. And so it was that indelible curiosity that I think everybody remembers him for. Uh, tremendous curiosity and uh, humility that he was uncovering perhaps some mysteries of nature and a great respect for it. And so those things are things that I think are indelible. And anybody who ever knew my dad or uh, anybody who has read about my father's work will see that come through. Broad curiosity uh, and humility. Yeah, um, with that, can we talk about um, your father Vincent's love of 
archaeology and history, you're mentioning arrowheads, um, cobblestones in the stream, um, Dutch barns is, is part of this prompt. So um, why these passions along with all of his others? Well, when he was a young man, probably in his teens, uh, probably even earlier than teens, uh, he was given the freedom to explore the neighborhood. That is to say, the, the area of forest and fields nearby where they lived in Schenectady. Uh, very early on, his father, my grandfather, took him fishing on the Point to Kill, which was near the Erie Canal, the old Erie Canal, which was still in use. And my father caught his first brook trout in, on the Point to Kill. And because he was encouraged by both his mother and fa father, my grandparents, he and his brothers and sisters would leave the house at any time they wanted to and go exploring. And uh, some of the things that happened is the fields around this area where I live were plowed every, every spring. And when you plow a field, you expose the soil, a new exposure of soil. And after a rainstorm, if you're clever and a good observer, you can walk in the field and find arrowheads and flint chips and stone implements. You can still do that today. Any place in the Mohawk Valley, from about Canada Harry down to the mouth of the Mohawk in uh, Cohoes, if there's a plowed field and you have a rainstorm, and if you're so inclined and maybe even get permission of the landowner to walk in their field before they plant, you'll find arrowheads and you'll find chips and you'll find quartz crystals and you'll find all kinds of things in the field. And that's just part of the way it is around here. Our whole area was occupied for thousands of years by Native Americans. So it was that ability to observe and find arrowheads and other things that I think uh, got his keen sense of observation started. Uh, he and his buddies decided that as part of their effort as a 12 year old, he published a pamphlet called Archaeology Record. There are vol several volumes of Archaeology Record, uh, two or three pages, they charge two cents a copy, and all kinds of people subscribe to it, including the bosses at GE, <laughs> people like Irving Lamier. And I don't know if Appy did, but he probably did. But certainly the farmers in the area, uh, 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 Robert Hartley and uh, Percy Van Epps, who were the uh, elder archaeologists and, and town historians, my father befriended these people. In fact, my father started the Van Epps Hartley chapter of the New York State Archaeological Association when he was in his 20s. He befriended these older people who were like him, uh, Indian relic hobbyists, and they all got along terrifically. So it was archaeology and, and then just exploring the, the region that got him started. And I know we're going to be getting into the Mohawk Valley Hiking Club, which is kind of an outgrowth of this wanderlust. So let's, let's go right into that. Uh, the Mohawk Valley Mountain Club. Okay, there's that. There's, the, there's this kind of amorphous organization called the, Schen the Schenectady Force uh, that uh, became uh, John Apperson's troops, uh, in a sense. Uh, how did all of this come together? Was, was the Mohawk Valley uh, Hiking Club kind of the, the beginning of it all? Was it the core? Was, was it GE? What was it that bound together all of these people in this common cause? Well, I think it was the conditions of the time. You got to remember 1929, what happened? <laughs> Later in that year, we had the Great Depression. And people were on hard times to begin with. As you may know, my, my father and all of the kids in the Schaefer family grew up poor. My uh, 
father had to drop out of high school in the 10th grade. Paul didn't finish school. I think my, my aunt Gertrude did, but they grew up in a very poor household, poor in the sense that they didn't have a lot of money. Uh, they were rich in every other respect. They had family love, they had the Catholic religion, they had food on the plate every day. My grandfather was an accountant at GE. So life was hard, but life was good. And uh, he, my father befriended a lot of uh, men and women in his peer group in their late teens, early 20s. They decided to get together and form a hiking club, which put a structure to their activity. January 6, 1929, the group of 18 to 20 hiked up the Moccasin Kill, which is about five miles from my house here, a beautiful little stream that has a waterfall about 30 feet high. And in January, of course, the waterfall is frozen and just a very spectacular little uh, area. They built a fire, which was typical of the hiking club. They would build a small campfire using small sticks, and then they'd have their lunch. And after a sandwich or two or a piece of meat on a stick, they had a reading of the founding papers of the Mohawk Valley Hiking Club. And their purpose was to enjoy the outdoors on weekends. They all had jobs, or many of them had jobs. Most of them did not have vehicles, so they had to either take public transportation, which at that time was uh, uh, the trolley. They would take the trolley, they would all uh, agree on a destination. Uh, another word for a destination could be a landmark, hint, hint. And they would go to various places in the Mohawk Valley, the Hudson Valley, the Hoosick Valley, the Schoharie Valley, and other places of interest. And they would take a, take a day, either a Saturday or Sunday, whether it was raining or snowing or hot and humid, they would spend a day on the weekend after church going out and hiking with their friends, exploring places, exploring caves, mountaintops, fields. And during that time, as you probably are aware, there were a lot of people that went belly up the farmers abandoned their buildings. And so oftentimes when they were on their hikes, they would run into a structure or two, a barn or a house. And my uncle Paul, who was fascinated with structures, spent his time measuring the interior of these barns, the interior of these houses. And it turned out that these measurements became foundational to him in terms of the ultimate career he had, which was carpentry and building. So they, they would spend their time exploring all kinds of different places, and in some, in some instances recording uh, the buildings. One of the things that they did, and Paul was head of the uh, Publicity and uh, Conservation Awareness Committee of the club, they started a protest. Uh, one of their first pamphlets was Wake Up Schenectady, and it was about the cutting of trees in, in Wolf Hollow. Apparently, the highway had decided that many of the big trees were either dangerous or in the way of cars, <laughs> and, and so they were cutting these great, big, beautiful trees down. And the hiking club took it on as one of their conservation, preservation ideas to protest this. A two-page pamphlet, pamphlet called Wake Up Schenectady was printed and distributed. And boy, did dad ever get in trouble for that. Apparently, the, uh, I heard this by, I don't know if my uncle told me or my dad told me, maybe it was written, that they got in trouble with the highway supervisor who said, you guys don't know who you're dealing with. We have to take these trees down and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and so it was a, a very rude awakening to the fact that there are people on the other side that you don't always get your way. 
but they were very adamant about uh, forest preservation and befriending people. And the hiking club was a center where people of all different walks of life came together. And it turns out that the hiking club was also a place where uh, mates met. <laughs> my father married my mother, who was a member of the club for years before he recognized what this wonderful redheaded nurse was doing. My uncle Paul married uh, Carolyn Kessever, who was a member of the club. Uh, Larry Shaw married uh, uh, another member of the club. So there was a, a way of young men and young women meeting each other in, a, in an area where they had kind of a common passion, and that was the out of doors. So uh, January 6th, 1929, are, do you mention that date as sort of the uh, official beginning of the Mohawk Valley Hiking Club? Um, the significance of that day in a nutshell is what? Well, it had nothing to do with the January 6th we'd all talk about. I know. But it was, it was that date. I have no idea why it was that date. It obviously had, had to be a Saturday or a Sunday in January, the first weekend of, of the month, probably. Uh, and that just was picked at, at random, I suppose. And uh, the time of year, huh. so what if it's icy and cold? You know, we could just do it. So I, I don't think there's any other significance to it, but that was the date. And I've gone back by myself on January 6th under incredibly cold conditions just to, to walk the route and start a fire and <laughs> sit there and reminisce. It's a gorgeous little place. Hmm. Well, while we're talking about the, the uh, hiking club, let's talk about the, uh, the ski train. Uh, I assume that was a direct outgrowth. The hiking club decided, hey, let's get into skiing. Um, we also, you know, we're going to have the Olympics to... Uh, the 32 Olympics were a major factor in there. Yeah, well, you have to back up to 1928 because in 19, in the, in the late 1920s, uh, dad and some of his buddies were involved in uh, cutting ski trails on Yanta Putrabur, which is the mountain just outside of Rotterdam Junction. It's the highest mountain or the highest hill, if you will, in the Mohawk Valley and uh, has beautiful terrain for skiing. And so they were uh, skiing and snowshoeing and uh, there was some local competition. I don't know who the sponsor was. I know there were a couple of sporting goods stores that awarded trophies for uh, races that took place in Central Park. But the ski, the cutting of ski trails on Yana Putcherberg was something that they were doing as far back as 1928. And I have maps uh, of the ski trails. And actually they had quite, quite a bit of competition on the ski trails. In fact, some of the, some of the guys from North Creek who later became instrumental in helping with the snow trains actually raced on Yana Putcherberg. They came down from North Creek because there was a ski downhill race and they came and competed. Uh, there were members of the GE who were skiers that came and skied on Yana Putcherberg. So if you fast forward now to 1932, 1932 is the year the Olympics were held at Lake Placid. And so the hiking club decided that a half dozen or a dozen and a half or so would all go up to be in the area of Lake Placid to hike and climb mountains and possibly see some of the Olympics. At the time, the Olympics, as you probably know, were very limited in terms of uh, events. There was, uh, there was skating, speed skating, there was ski jumping and cross country skiing. Those were the big medal events that everybody remembers. And ironically, members of the American Legion of North Crick also went to the 1932 Olympics, totally unrelated, but the hiking club camped out at Adirondack Lodge in the lean-tos with their sleeping bags, which they made, and with the winter clothes that they also made and knitted, the, the wool socks and the wool sweaters and the wool hats, but they went 
They went hiking in the McIntyre Range. That was their main activity. Sure, they saw some of the cross-country ski teams who were off coming in their area. In fact, I think it was the Swift, uh, no, the Swedes got lost and the hiking club helped them get back to where they needed to go. And uh, in the bobsled, one of the Germans got injured during the bobsled run and members of the hiking club spoke German, went to the hospital and talked in the native language to the bobsledder who got injured. That was one of the activities that they participated in. The other thing is 1932 and 1933 were both very lean snow years. They had to go bring boxcars full of snow from Old Forge to Lake Placid in order to have snow on which to land their ski jumping. And the hiking club boot packed the outrun. So there are pictures I have of my father and others stepping, boot packing by climbing up the outrun and back down the outrun, maybe sliding down the outrun. And so th those were some of the activities that were memorable from the hiking club during the 32 Olympics. So it was shortly after 1932 that my father had heard about the snow trains out of Boston that went up to ski areas in New Hampshire. And he thought, boy, that would be kind of exciting to have some activity where all the skiers in the Schenectady area could enjoy that sport. And so he uh, contacted the railroad companies because that was the easy way to get people to go to a ski area would be to use the rails. And he somehow convinced Dr. Langmuir, who at that time he had been become an associate of Dr. Langmuir's, Langmuir had a plane. And so they flew in the airplane. They flew over toward uh, current Dover, uh, Vermont, where Haystack Mountain and now currently Mount Snow is located and thought, boy, that would be a great area for skiing. And they actually made a commitment to do a, a ski train to Vermont, but there wasn't any snow. So they had to cancel that. And they also went down to the Catskills. And there's a mountain down there whose name I can't pronounce, uh, but it's down near in Greene County. There's a mountain down there that was perfect for skiing. And then they flew up to North Creek. Of course, the family was already well ensconced in North Creek area, Baker's Mills and the whole area around there, dad and, and uh, some of the members of the club were very familiar with North Creek. And so that became the target was to go to North Creek. And so the, the guys that had been cutting trail on Yanapuchaburg, along with my dad and, and, and uh, some of the GE folks, went to North Creek and befriended the people at the American Legion who were instrumental in also already cutting trails on the Gore Massive. By Gore Massive, we don't, we don't mean just Gore Mountain, where the ski area is now. They were on the mountain called Peak Gay, which is where the Barton Mines are. So they were already cutting trail. They were using, you know, following old logging roads and uh, trappers trails and maybe even Indian trails where people could easily go through the woods, uh, you know, and a corridor was already open by let's say the loggers, they would have a trail maybe uh, 12 feet wide. And they just basically cut some of the undergrowth so that you could ski down once the snow covered up the, uh, the stubble underneath. And so dad and his friends were already familiar with how to prepare a ski trail. The guys in North Creek were already <laughs> cutting ski trail. What a perfect match. And Bill Gleasing, who was the genius of the House of Magic, the publicity arm of GE, was a member of the hiking club. Bill Gleasing, a farmer, uh, uh, you know, that, that's how he made his living outside of the GE, had a beautiful farm. Uh, he agreed to go up and give one of his famous House of Magic talks. 
And that captured the audience and captured all the spirit of, of North Korea about having uh, ride up and slide down as a theme. Uh, come up by train, get in dump trucks from Barton Mine, get in cars, get in buses, go up the road to the top of Peak Gay, where the head trailhead for all the cross country runs coming down Peak Gay was located. So I think it was just a coincidence <laughs> that they shared the fact that they'd both been to the, the 32 Olympics. And that increased the strength of the bond among the people in North Creek with the people from Schenectady. Uh, woven through all this, of course, is the role of John Apperson, Happy. Uh, he was working with Paul and my dad and other members of the hiking club at his place on Lake George. And so the GE folks, the engineers and the scientists, indeed Langmuir and Katie Blodgett, who got land right abutting John Apperson's place, that was the center of activity for preservation and conservation ideas. I mentioned the Wake Up, Amer Wake Up Schenectady. It was unnatural for Paul to be close friends with Apperson, who was advocating that they use the tools that were easy, the camera and hiking and going out into the woods and documenting some of the things that were happening in the woods. So it was a natural blend of all these different threads that I think made, made, made a lot of sense to everybody. And the, the best of all was they had a good time. <laughs> there was no stress. They were enjoying what they were doing. My, my father reflecting on the snow train days said, you know, <laughs> Gore Mountain now has a big fancy uh, gondola and, and uh, all kinds of toes. And uh, people are enjoying, thousands of people enjoy Gore Mountain. But he says, I think we had more fun. They danced, they did square dances on the way back down to uh, Schenectady. Uh, another sidebar was my mother, who was a nurse, was appointed head of the first aid committee. In 1933, she trained experienced skiers, some of whom were on the Olympic team, believe it or not, and some of whom had raced here in Schenectady, uh, Dr. Dan O'Keefe from North Creek. And uh, she formed basically in 1933, what's known as the first ski patrol in the country. Uh, the National Ski Patrol was started in 1938. So the bragging rights for ski patrols goes to the uh, North Creek group and the North Creek and Schenectady group who uh, saw to it that when the snow trains came, unlike the trains that came out of Boston that my dad read about, they had some injuries, ankles, wrists, you name it. They had the, the Schenectady snow trains, eventually the New York City snow trains that came up to North Creek had a, a ski patrol that was sweeping the trails after the last run when the train was ready to leave. They left nobody behind. They treated people if they got injured. Fantastic thinking, but that's the way they did things. It's a great story. May, I'm sorry, I jumped over one of your questions. We'll go back and let you uh, ask yours. Yeah, no worries at all. Um, so my question was um, just about the long path. And um, if you could tell us about how the idea of the long path to your father. Sure, May, thank you for that question. <clears throat> In 1929, the club was formed, the hiking club was formed. And uh, Paul and my dad and other members of the hiking club had befriended W.W. W. Christman out in Schoharie near Quaker Street. Christman was the, called the poet of Heldebergs and uh, a wonderful man. And he had a beautiful waterfall on the Bosenkill. And uh, the hiking club became very close with uh, W.W. Chrisman and did a lot of their uh, tree planting and they had an annual Thanksgiving breakfast. 
which we continue today. We just, this Thanksgiving, celebrated the 92nd annual Thanksgiving breakfast at Christmas. But it was because of these wonderful landmarks, these wonderful places that I think, and, and also reading about uh, John Wesley Powell's treks down the Green River in the Grand Canyon, knowing about Benton McKay's Appalachian Trail, which celebrates high, highlands from Georgia to Mount Katahdin in Maine, reading about John uh, Taylor's Long Trail in Vermont. These were all part of the context of, of activity and thinking about long trails, long paths. And my dad's hiking philosophy was one of going from landmark to landmark, not of walking a blaze trail. A blaze trail is a lot like a superhighway, kind of like the throughway, very boring. And my, that's the opposite of my father. My father was for back roads and unmarked trails. And his wood sense was all you really need is a compass, if you need a compass, a map, a topographic map, and good wood sense, an ability to take a look at things and go in the place that was safe. Not that danger was off the map completely, but he was always pretty safe when he hiked. He had adequate supplies, knew how to build a fire, took along food that could be cooked, and watched the clock, which he learned from his father, my grandfather, and also Irving Lamier, were well known to hike in the Alps. And Irving Lamier's rule from his parents was, watch the clock, you need to come back. So whenever the clock says you have enough time to return, you return. That was a habit of my father's. We would go for a couple hours because in a couple hours, we'd have our lunch over a fire and then you could come back. And coming back was usually a little quicker because in the wintertime, we'd already broken trail. So coming back was easier. But the long path was an inspiration that came out of the mix of celebrating the Eastern Highlands of New York. The original idea was start at, starting at Bear Mountain near, near West Point and continuing on up into the high peaks. That was the concept. And he laid out on paper and top, topographic maps a route that would go from that area of Southern New York around the Schwangunk Mountains up through the Catskills and the Schoharie Hills, the Helderbergs, the Rotterdam Hills, the Glenville Hills, up into the Adirondacks. But it was not a, not a blazed trail until the 60s. In the 60s, a couple of hikers in the southern part of the state took, upon, took it upon themselves to create the blazed trail, which everyone calls the long path. And all of the quote, end-to-enders start down by the current beginning of, the, or the, it's really not current because now it's 175th station of the subway, believe it or not. That's the beginning of the long path. But George Washington Bridge was traditionally the beginning of the long path. It was, to, it was moved conceptually from Bear Mountain down to the George Washington Bridge the uh, Jersey side of the George Washington Bridge. That's the, the quote, start of the long path. And the current end of the Blaze Trail is Thatcher Park in the Heldberg. But in the 1970s, the Long Path North Hiking Club decided that they probably would want, or not probably, but they wanted to extend the long path from Thatcher Park on up to the top of Whiteface Mountain. And about that same time, my dad was thinking about creating a guide, a field guide to the Long Path North. And so he put together on paper uh, landmarks, 84, 82 to 84 landmarks that he would recognize as 
uh, fantastic day hikes in a 15 mile wide corridor. So there would be a landmark here, a landmark there that he would write about, get a topographic map to show where the exact location was, and then encourage people to use the map, go take a day and go find whatever the goal was. It might've been a, uh, for example, an ancient tree, which was the, the, the border of the three counties, Tyron County, and now current Saratoga County, Schenectady County, and Montgomery County. So in other words, all of those different landmarks uh, became spots where you could go hiking. And there was to be no trail. His philosophy, as I mentioned, was no trail, just good wood sense, a compass, and a map. And the idea was no two steps could go, should go in the same place. And uh, people that know all about the trail problems in the Adirondacks, especially around the high peaks, understand the importance of that philosophy. Uh, there are trails now that are becoming herd trails and it's a, the erosion is a terrible problem, et cetera. But his idea was to avoid all of that, which of course was impossible. But the Blaze Trail, uh, now is extended by the, the grateful generosity of Warren County, who is spearheading an effort to recognize the landmarks all the way from Gilboa, New York, up to the top of Whiteface Mountain. But the hiking club was central to getting all that started. And my father, working with the editor of the, of the New York was it the New York Post or the New York Times? I can't remember the name of the paper. I think it was the but Post. The Post. Uh, Raymond Torrey uh, took a li who is a, a hiker, uh, took, a, took a liking to Dad's idea of the long path and uh, celebrated every week, uh, wrote a story in the New York Post about the long path. That popularized the long path for many hikers. Uh, and of course, the, the details were uh, written up and the, he would probe dad about, well, what kind of way do you to go? How do you, how do you get here? How do you get there? And so the, the publication in the New York Post uh, described a kind of a trail, but it was the people in the 1960s that decided that they wanted to make it a blaze trail. And it's a terrific thing. I mean, there's hundreds of people now have completed it end to end. And it's, they, they've got a Friends of the Long Path group on the internet. Uh, uh, Ed Walsh, who is one of the champions of the Long Path, uh, who also has hiked the end to end. Ed Walsh is also a person that probably is the only one that's ever done the Long Path in its entirety. He claims that he climbed the or went the long path following Dad's notes, and I believe him because I got his I got his records of the uh, GPS locations, not the GPS locations, but the coordinates for many of the landmarks going north. Okay. So there's only one person that I know of has really done the entire long path. And is he still living, Ed Walsh? Oh yeah, that? sure, absolutely. Okay. Well, we're going to have to talk it's, to him it's the the the. The guy that recognizes all the end to enders <laughs> from New York City up to uh, the Thatcher Park. That's great. But uh, the other thing I was going to say is uh, the uh, my dad and his friend Al Getz, who was a member of the hiking club, did walk from my house here in Schenectady up to North Creek, following the Long Path route. So those are the only two I know of that took the a longer path. Uh, I've only done a section or two. I've only done a couple of the landmarks. And so uh, I have a lot of work to do. My son wants to do the long path, which is cool. Yeah, that is cool. So let's take one more question and then let's open it up. And I think um, at least one last topic, one last prompt for you will be ancient windows of the earth, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and this is a story, uh, thanks to uh, you, Jim, for giving us permission to excerpt this from Vince's book, also to Don Rittner. Uh, Don Rittner wrote this book along with uh, Vince. 
but this just gives you an example of uh, Vince's uh, artistry with rock slices. Can you like in three minutes explain what's happening here? Because we're gonna continue this conversation next week with Greg Schaefer, because apparently Greg Schaefer now has the diamond tool, diamond bit saw that makes this possible. Give us sure. a, a little preview of what we can expect next week and then we'll open it up. Well, in a, you take a rock, any kind of rock, can't be bigger than 18 inches in diameter. You, you slice it with a saw. And if you slice it saw curve thick, which is about an eighth of an inch thick, if it's, if it's of the right crystalline structure, it becomes translucent. And so what that did was collect a lot of rocks from the Adirondacks. He had another goal in mind, but basically he was finding out how to do the cutting of the rock. And if you do that, you get some beautiful translucent slices of rock. Uh, on the left, upper left of the pictures, you'll see one of the intricate designs that he uh, fabricated, and that is to lay the stone onto a translucent fiberglass sheet, glue it to the sheet using a, kind of an epoxy glue, and then the design, those curly cues, are out of the uh, famous Fibonacci spiral. Fibonacci, of course, the Italian mathematician who uh, discovered the divine proportion, which is the relationship between the, the uh, isosceles triangle and the curve of the golden, the, the golden curve or the golden spir spiral. And if you'll see at the lower right, my father standing next to the six foot diameter window that he created in honor of my grandparents, his parents, that, are, that has been installed in the St. James Catholic Church in North Creek. And he has a, a detailed story of creation using the stones of the area of North Creek to illustrate how wonderful uh, the spiritual spirit, the, the spirit of the Adirondacks is. He's in, included in that story, the hexagon which is of course the shape of a snow crystal. And so he combined the hexagon with the stone, especially if you'll see on the far bottom left, that very red stone is the garnet matrix that comes from Ruby Mountain and the Barton Mines. So throughout the story, are the stories of each of these crystalline structures that he was able to uncover by, by slicing the rock and seeing what was inside. Mm. Wow, stunning. Now, these are, if you will, abstract art. And you'll see when my cousin comes in, Greg, my cousin Greg, his father, Carl Schaefer, my uncle, uh, created some absolutely fantastic naturalistic art out of the stone slices. So he created uh, waterfalls and, and landscape. I believe there is also the Matterhorn, which he made out of stone. And it's an absolute uh, almost 3D, <laughs> 3D, picture of the Matterhorn or 3D picture of a waterfall because he was so creative in putting together pieces of stone that made it look real. So you'll have this uh, at another time, but the first part was, again, dad's curiosity, what's inside this rock? And from the, apparently from early in his education, when he was at school, one of his favorite teachers was a naturalist, a geologist, and she inspired him to think about rocks and where they came from. And so in his 80s, here he is, cutting rocks, discovering what they are, what they look like, where they came from. And it turns out many of the rocks down here in the Mohawk Valley came from the Adirondacks, 
because the ice sheet, the glaciers, brought them here. And he tells that story in his book. Well, he does. He sees a uh, yellow pinkish porphyry on the banks of the, what, the Mohawk River. Uh, and he concluded it came from the Lake Champlain area. Yep. Amazing. Amazing. <clears throat> so the glacier was, was scraping the Adirondacks into rounded mountains, not like the Rockies. And uh, these rounded mountains had a glacier that was bringing it south and east. And he could, he could trace the exact same stone to where it came from, the quarry where it came from. Wow. Well, that is remarkable. We'll talk more about that next week. Bill, do we have any questions from the audience? Any questions that you want to jump in with uh, in our, our last remaining 10 minutes or so? Yeah, I, I don't know about uh, the audience at this point. Maybe uh, Sarah or Don has a handle on that. But uh, uh, yeah, there's any number of ways I could go here. But I, I thought it might be good to uh, open it up, ask uh, Ellen and Dave uh, if, if they'd like to weigh in with any questions at this point. Yeah, Dave has actually raised his hand. So we're going to ask him to unmute. OK, thank you so much, Dan <laughs> and Bill and uh, May. Jim. Um, your dad befriended Tom Porter of the Mohawk Nation and, and was involved so much in, the, in the, the work to bring the Mohawk peoples back to the Mohawk Valley. Can you tell a bit of that story and why, what, what, what preceded it and how, how, it, how, it, how he befriended Tom and, and what happened? Thank yeah, you. That's, that's a fascinating. It made, made the whole thing come full circle, you know? I mean, here dad was as a kid finding arrowheads and fascinated with Native American stuff. And then in his late, well, mid 80s, he heard about uh, a, 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 a young man in Akwesasne up near the Canadian border who was a Mohawk, descendant of the Mohawk, the original Mohawks who were in our area. And uh, heard that he was interested in returning to the Mohawk Valley. And just turned out, serendipity, just turned out that the, the Montgomery uh, Manor, the poorhouse, and the lands around it were available. Some 80 acres of beautiful farmland. And one of the landmarks, in fact, the original landmark, in fact, when I was a kid, we used to go up to the spring, which is on the property. And so he wrote Tom and uh, said, there's a beautiful place that you ought to come take a look at. And my father arranged with the supervisors in Montgomery County to allow the auction to take place with no competing bids. And Tom Porter and his people were successful in bidding $281,000 for the property, which was the Montgomery Manor. Beautiful location, a beautiful place just west of Fonda. And of course, Tom and his cohorts were, were just thrilled to death that they got the land. And my father at the time was going to go to the auction, but he had a heart attack. It was his fatal heart attack. He was in the Ellis Hospital. And lo and behold, Tom Porter and a convoy of Mohawk Indians dressed in ribbon shirts drove down to the Ellis Hospital and came up and were came up and went into the uh, ICU where my father was and introduced themselves. I remember hearing uh, Tom saying to my father, "I'm Tom. I'm Tom Porter." And my father, I remember hearing him say. I know exactly who you are. And he was so thrilled, literally on his deathbed, to have provided the Mohawk ancestors offset, the descendants of the Mohawk, to come back to the Mohawk Valley. Just a fantastic story. And there's a book written by Tom Porter uh, called Ganahojalege, which is the village, the little settlement that they have. And in it, he includes the letter, a copy of the, the letter my dad wrote him, which is a beautiful story. Uh, there's a big mystery about who donated the $281,000. And uh, we just don't know. 
Wow. David, great question. Jim, uh, great answer. Uh, one last question, let's conclude. Um, Jim, if you were to describe the, the Schaefer legacy, and looking at that the contributions of the entire family, the brothers, the, the entire family, the parents who, who raised these remarkable kids and into these, these pioneers in wilderness, what, what is the legacy? I would say deep respect for the Adirondacks and, and keeping it wild. I, I think that's, that's the big bottom line. I had 26 first cousins. All of us spent time in the Adirondacks at one time or another in our lives. We have a deep respect for it. And we have kids and grandkids who also have the opportunity to experience the exact same thing that my grandparents brought their family to. And we want to try to keep it that way. So I think that's the legacy, which is deep respect for Forever Wild and keeping it, preserving it and fighting for it. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop. The, I'm stopping the Zoom recording. Um, and I'll stop the, the uh, YouTube um, live stream shortly. Any parting words uh, from anyone? We're going to have, we hope, uh, Greg Schaefer next week. We'll continue the conversation. Uh, Sarah, Bill, uh, anything? May, thank you very much for your role in this. No, thank just, you, May, uh, and thank you so much, Jim. That was yeah, fantastic. Just, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Really uh, great. Hardy, thank you to, to Jim. Really uh, great stuff. Really, really an interesting uh, conversation today. And uh, thanks to Dave and Ellen and, and Ken for signing on. Hope you guys will be, uh, be back next week for the continuation. And May, thank you for your questions and your participation. Good luck in school. Yeah. Yeah. Thank we'll you so there. much. Thank you for being here. May, I, have daughter, like I have a daughter just like you who's at Purchase, and she's sure. she's going to be graduating this year. So I, I feel for you. Yeah. That COVID, that COVID is a nasty one. Be careful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so May will have the challenge of uh, cutting this down to 2,000 words. It'll probably be about a 10,000 word transcript. Uh, May's <laughs> assignment is to pick out the gems. Mm -hmm. in it and it will be a challenge i know because there's so much great stuff in this but uh we will of course have the, the full uh video is available to anyone who wants to see it so it's there but with all that said i will uh conclude it at this point thanks everybody thank you